Would you take God's Word tonight and open, please, to the book of 1 Timothy? It's our privilege to study 1 Timothy, even though we're doing that on Sunday night. And we're in chapter 5, and tonight we're going to look at verses 9 down to verse 16. And i just read with you just a few verses out of chapter 5, verse 9. Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man. So I want to talk tonight about honoring godly widows. Uh, David Lloyd George once said, the true test of a civilization is the way it treats its old people. And I, I think he's right there. I read a, 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 a disturbing report from, out of the U.S. News and World Report. It was an article that uncovered the ugly fact of brutality against the aged by their own families. And the article said this, each year perhaps a million elderly Americans or about one out of every 25 are abused by relatives. Can you imagine that? And then the article goes on to talk about this abuse, the different types of abuse that the elderly have to go through. And, uh, you know, we in the church are sometimes guilty of another form of abuse if we're not careful, and that would just simply be apathy, not caring for the elderly, our senior saints. So this sermon tonight is about taking care of widows. Now, I know that that's not really a hot topic as far as sermons is concerned. Um, you know, you probably have never heard a whole sermon on taking care of widows ever in your life. So congratulations, you're going to hear one tonight. But the reason for that is very simply because we're preaching through 1 Timothy, and guess what Paul deals with? He takes 14 verses to deal with honoring widows. And so to God, this is, must be a very important topic. I mean, this is the inspired Word of God, Amen. And if God takes time to talk about this, then we should take time to learn and study and see what God has to say about it. In fact, there are many passages in the Bible that deal with widows. The Bible is very clear that God has a special concern uh, for widows and orphans. There are many passages that lay down laws to protect widows and orphans. For example, in Psalm 68, verse 5, God is described as the protector and the judge of widows and orphans. It says, a father of the fatherless and a judge for the widows is God in his holy habitation. In Psalm 146, verse 9, it says, the Lord protects the strangers. He supports the fatherless and the widow. And then also in Deuteronomy 27, verse 19, cursed is he who distorts the justice due an alien, orphan, and widow. And then in the New Testament, James chapter 1, James talks about pure religion or true religion, and he said, what is true religion? It is to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep one's self unspotted from the world. So caring for women who are alone in the world is one of the best ways to honor God and to love your neighbor. It is Christianity at its finest. And so Paul is giving Timothy some counsel with this matter. Evidently, the church at Ephesus had a number of widows, And there was perhaps maybe a bit of confusion on how to take care of widows. And so Paul is going to give some wise practical counsel talking about how the church should wisely take care of widows that are in their midst. The key verse is back in verse 3. Look in chapter 5, verse 3, where he says, Honor widows that are widows indeed. And this comes straight out of the fifth commandment, to honor your father and mother. This is all a part of that. And the word for honor here in verse 3 means to fix value to. It's where we get our word honorarium. You know, when a special speaker comes and preaches here at Grace, we give them what is called an honorarium. That's not a pat on the back or thank you, God bless you. We actually give them money, you know, to thank them for their service. I think this is the idea behind the word here, to support and help widows that are widows indeed. In other words, there are some widows that are worthy of this support from the church that have genuine needs. They're needy people, and the church should honor them. And then there are some other widows that really don't need to be given this support or need to be put on uh, the list, you could say. And so you have to determine where the legitimate needs are. Now, evidently, there was a list that the church kept of widows that were worthy of the church's support. And, And if you were worthy of the church's support, you were put on that list. You say, where do you get that from? Look down in verse number nine again where it says, let a, not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old. Look where it says taken into the number. It literally means to be enrolled or to put on the list. This is a word that was used to talk about enrolling soldiers. 
when a soldier basically registered to be a soldier, he was enrolled, he was put on the list. So this is the same word. So there was a list for widows, and you had to be qualified in the early church to be put on that list. In fact, you can divide this section of 1 Timothy up into two sections. First, he deals with widows that should not be put on the list, and then widows that should be put on the list. You can kind of divide it up that way. or you can, Another way to say that would be the duty to support needy widows and the duty not to support uh, other widows that are not put on the list. So again, evidently the early church was systematic in taking care of widows. Now the church at Ephesus was still relatively a, a new church plant, and, but they knew how to put first things first, and the church was already at this point in their life and ministry maintaining a role for widows. Now, what was this list for? I think we know, I, I would think that we could say we know that it was for support. Certainly, it was f- to make sure that Christian widows in their midst were being taken care of. And so widows were registered so that they could be helped. And I think we can draw this conclusion by verse, at the end of verse number 16, where it talks about caring for those who are really widows or widows indeed. Make sure, Paul said to Timothy, that the church cares for those who are widows indeed. So I think that. Part of the reason for a widow to be put on the list was to make sure that they were be cared for. And I think the model for this was the first church in Jerusalem. They had already organized a daily distribution of food. And that's in Acts chapter 6, verse number 1, where it's, it tells us that in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So somewhere along the line, there were some of the widows that were being neglected. And this created a problem in that early church in Jerusalem that was exploding and growing, and they were trying to make sure to meet all the needs. And I don't think this was on purpose. I think that just maybe because of the lack of organization and administration, there were some widows that were not put on the list and they were being ignored. And this caused a little bit of a murmur in the church. And so this led to the, the apostles saying, you know, we need to you know, find some men who are devout, faithful, trustworthy, filled with the Holy Spirit that we can put over this whole thing and to make sure that these widows are taken care of. So again, I think the early church in Jerusalem was a uh, kind of an example of this. But then there are other ideas that the widows that are on this list were also widows that were serving in the church, that they had some kind of special ministry. For example, the New Testament uh, pastor who's now in heaven, John Stott, a wonderful pastor, in his commentary, Guard the Truth, he said this, he wondered if this register was, quote, not for widows needing support, but for widows capable of offering service. So his argument was he thought that the list was more for service than for support. That was his argument. Another one came along, another commentator, argues that the role was for both support and service. If a widow could render service to the church, or needed to be support, they were put on the list. But I think in studying the New Testament, we can at least say this, that there was an organization, a group of widows, and they, had, they were very identifiable, and um, they were a group that kind of came together and served. They were a notable group in the early church. An example of this would be uh, Dorcas in the city of Joppa. This story is recorded in Acts chapter 9. Remember Dorcas, she was described as a woman who was full of good works and acts of charity, and she was a widow. In fact, the Bible says in Acts 9, 36, now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. Now when she dies here in Acts chapter 9, the whole community mourned for her. They're so grieved that they send for Peter, and when Peter arrives, that the Bible says that all the widows stood beside him weeping, showing the garments that Dorcas had made for them, that she had made with her own hands. So that kind of gives you an idea of what some of the ministry that she had was. And again, Acts chapter 9, verse 39. Then Peter arose and went up with them, and when he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping and showing their coats and garments, which Dorcas made while she was with them. And so you know the rest of the story. If you've read Acts, Peter miraculously brought Dorcas back to life. And when he did that, he called the saints and the widows, and he presented her alive. Acts chapter 9, verse 41, where it says, And he gave her his hand and lifted her up, 
And when he had called the saints and the widows, presented her alive. But the thing I want you to see from this account in Acts 9 is that it's clear that the widows had a distinct identity in the early church. They're a group of women that came together and were serving in the church. And there were large numbers of them. And by the third century, they formed an official order of the church. Again, John Stott writes this, These widows gave themselves to prayer, nursing the sick, cared for the orphans, visited Christians in prison, evangelized pagan women, taught female converts in preparation for their baptism, end quote. Uh, that's John Stott, who did kind of a historical look at the ministry of widows in the church. By the Middle Ages, however, few, if any, churches were really following the guidelines that were prescribed here in 1 Timothy chapter 5. And I would venture to say that probably not many contemporary churches have really looked at this chapter and followed the pattern that Paul lays out here in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5. But one thing we know for sure, that uh, godly widows can be an incredible blessing to the local church. Uh, Warren Worsby kind of gives a note about this. Uh, he writes, It's been my experience in three different pastorates that godly widows are spiritual powerhouses in the church. And he, he goes on to say, They are the backbone of the prayer meetings. They give themselves to visitation. They swell the ranks of the Sunday school. And so he says, What a great blessing that widows have been in his experience in the church. On the other hand, if they're not godly, if they're not living for the Lord, they can be a problem. And Worsby also wrote about that. On the other side, he said, it's also been my experience that if a widow is not godly, she could be a great problem to the church. She will demand attention, complain about what the younger people do, often hang on the phone and gossip. Of course, it's not really gossip. She only wants her friends to be able to pray more intelligently. That's from Warren Worsby, not me, all right? But he's right. Now, Paul counsels, is giving counsel to Timothy to honor widows that are widows indeed. That is, you honor widows and you help widows that are worthy of the support and help from the church. That's the whole point. Now, so how do we know who to support? So there are really just two groups here that I want to give you. First would be the widows to register on the list. That's the major point number one of the sermon. <laughs> The widows to register on the list. These are widows, Timothy, that you want to put on the list, okay? And so Paul makes a list of qualifications before a widow can be placed on the list, that list where they would get support from the church. Number one, notice what he says in verse number nine again. Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old. So what's the first qualification? At least 60 years old. If you were younger than 60, uh, 60 then... You could not be put on the list. So this was, was considered the age of retirement in the first century. Don't you wish that was the age of retirement today, <laughs> you know? Um, it is said that a woman at this age was not likely to get remarried in that day, although 60 really is not considered old today, right? Can I get an amen from some of the folks here? Now, this is especially true for me because I'm approaching 60 in a few months. So it's looking younger and younger every day. When I was a kid, it was ancient. Now, very young. But anyway, so this is why some think that this list is really a more than just a, a, a list for support. Some think it's a list for service. For example, um, uh, the New Testament scholar Donald Guthrie, he says that these qualifications would seem overtly strict if a widow had to meet all of them before she could get any help from the church. And so he thinks that these are all qualifications for service from a widow in the church. You know, they had to qualify in order to serve and maybe be supported because of their service in the church, according to this New Testament scholar. Others disagree and say, no, this was simply a list of widows who receive support from the church. And what we're reading here are those who give a pattern of life characterized by good works. And so, again, there's a little bit of division on what, what this is. I think this is just simply support from the church. And one of the things Paul says is, look, they have to be at least 60 years old before they can get support from the church. And also faithful to her husband. It says in verse number 9, under three words, you're having been the wife of one man. And literally the Greek reads, a one man woman. So the question is, does this mean that a woman who had been married twice cannot receive support from the church when needed? 
I think that seems unlikely, especially in light of the fact that later on we're going to see that Paul encourages younger widows to remarry, okay? And if that were the case, they wouldn't qualify. They would be disqualified from support for, from the church. So this expression, a one-man woman, it, literally it's talking about a woman who was totally devoted to her husband while he was alive. It speaks of the, the faithfulness, the love, and devotion that she showed to her husband during the time when he was with her. Fidelity to her husband. But then there's another qualification. You had to be at least 60. You had to be devoted, faithful to your husband. You had to have that kind of a testimony, but also a reputation for good works. Look at verse number 10. Well reported of for good works. She had to have a testimony and a reputation for doing good. Now, Paul goes on to list some of these good works that she had to do. If she had brought up children, that's one good work there. She had to bring up children with a, in a family. Raising a family is the most important good work that a Christian woman can do. And so this would include, by the way, more than her own if she was able to raise her own children. There were many orphans in the ancient world in that time. So she could take care of not only her own children, but perhaps orphan children. A godly woman has pity on all children, and whenever she has the opportunity to show love and care, she'll do it. And so she raised her family. She loves and takes care of children. But also, if she lodged strangers, it says in verse number 10, so she showed hospitality to those who were strangers. Now, hospitality was a very high value in the ancient church, and part of this was because uh, of the traveling missionaries that went out sh sharing the gospel. Uh, there were no you know, hotels like we have today, and the inns that they had were not really good places for Christians to stay because there was a lot of bad things that went on in places like that. And so traveling missionaries and preachers were dependent upon the hospitality of Christians during that time. And if she were a woman that would show hospitality to strangers and those that were preaching the gospel. You remember the whole epistle of 2 John is John instructing a woman about being, being careful of who she lets into her house, showing hospitality. He commends her for her love, for her desire to show love, but he also warns her, look, don't take in false teachers. Don't take in those who are not preaching the true gospel. You don't want to be a fellow helper of those that are spreading error. Be careful. You don't want to lose your reward. So that whole epistle of 2 John is a reward. So that whole epistle of 2 John is a perhaps a widow taking in strangers and being good to them. Um, according to Chrysostom, the hospitality here spoken of is not merely a friendly reception, but one given with zeal, with readiness, and going about it as if one were receiving Christ himself. So here's a woman that shows great hospitality. But also along with that, look what it says in verse 10, as she have washed the saint's feet. Now, this is the first thing a good hostess did for her guests in the ancient world. When a person came in for a meal, a guest, the first thing that would be done was their sandals were removed, the, the, the roads were dusty, and their feet would be washed. Now, sometimes this was done by a servant or a slave if it were a, a household that was a pretty wealthy and well-off household. But here he's talking about a widow who washed the feet of saints. So, Perhaps this is a traveling preacher that comes to her for hospitality, and the first thing she'll do is take off his sandals, and she does the menial task of a slave, and she washes his feet. Here's a woman that's willing to perform humble and even menial service for her brothers and sisters in Christ. And foot washing would also be a reminder of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. We remember Jesus, right, on the night that he was betrayed, the disciples were arguing about who was the greatest in the kingdom. And what does the Bible say Jesus did? He took a towel, girded himself, wrapped it around them, got a bowl of water, and he began to do what? Well, wash the disciples' feet. The disciples couldn't believe he was doing that. The ministry of a, of a slave or a menial servant, and um, how could the Lord of glory take the place of a slave? And the answer was very simple. He was showing the disciples, how to love others, how to love one another. He didn't come in the world to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Washing his disciples' feet was a preview of, a, of, a, of another event that was to come when he would pour out his life 
when his own blood would be shed on the cross for the sins of the world. So whenever a Christian washes the feet of saints or performs some humble act of service, he or she follows the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here Paul says if, if this woman is willing to do this, to show humility and serve in this way, but then also in verse number 10, notice where it says, if she have relieved the afflicted and devoted herself to every good work. Now this list is not meant to be exhaustive. What we have here is just a few examples that are given. But you get kind of the general idea, the gist of what he's saying. And, and again, what he mentions here is ministering to the afflicted, those under pressure, those who are going through trouble, those who are suffering. One commentator writes, she nurses the sick back to health, gives food to the hungry, comforts the victims of persecution, and so forth. Charity begins at home, but then it spreads all around the community. And that's so very true. There's a woman that's an example by her humble service. You know, one of the reasons that the church has always been a leader in mercy ministry is because Christian people, especially Christian women, have devoted themselves to all kinds of good deeds and serving in this capacity. Christians were the first to rescue abandoned babies. They were the first to set up schools for orphans, the first to develop nursing care, the first to establish homes for the elderly, and on we could go. And so here's a woman that has that kind of heart, that kind of love, that kind of care, that kind of willingness just to serve the saints of God. Susan Hunt, in her book, By Design, God's Distinctive Calling for Women, wrote about the life of a woman named Elizabeth Fry. And in 1813, a woman by the name of Anna Buxton took Elizabeth Fry to visit London's infamous Newgate prison. And while they were there. While they arrived, these two women were nearly overwhelmed by the miserable conditions in which the prisoners lived there in that prison. And Hunt goes on to write, quote, 300 women with their young children were shut up together in four rooms without sufficient clothing, absolutely without any beds but the floor, in the cold of winter, with no one to guide or control them, and with nothing to do. They were allowed to receive money and to buy as much intoxicating drink as they liked in the prison. The result was that those four rooms were like a den of wild beasts. The governor of the prison dreaded to approach their cells. Now, these two women that went in and saw these conditions didn't know what else to do other than just to kneel down and pray, and that's the first thing that they did. And as they did, some of the prisoners gathered around them And Elizabeth Fry said, I heard weeping as we were praying over them. Fry would later say, a very solemn quiet was observed. It was a very striking scene. The poor people on their knees around us in deplorable conditions. And Elizabeth Fry devoted 30 years of her life to sharing the gospel with those women in that prison there. But she doesn't just share the gospel with her words. She did it with her deeds. At first, the authorities tried to stop her because they thought, you know, it's hopeless, the situation is hopeless. They tried to prevent her from doing what she was doing. But she persuaded the authorities, please let me try. Please let me try to make a difference here. And so she began by sewing wool garments for the prisoners. She started a school for their children. She made the prisoners agree not to swear, beg, or quarrel. She brought supplies so they could do needlework. Every morning and evening, she gathered them at the sound of a bell for Bible reading and prayer. And what was the result? The whole character of Newgate Prison was radically transformed. Hunt again goes on the right. In a few weeks, the magistrates came again and saw the results of the effort. The poor women were sitting quietly at work and listening to reading, decently dressed with calm and cheerful faces. The gentlemen acknowledged the change most gratefully, and they felt that it is indeed the mother's uh, heart that gives the hope and patience needed to endure and save the naughty children of the world. From this first prison, these plans of helping the female prisoners by Christian teaching and by employment and by all kinds of sisterly sympathy and, and succor spread throughout England and throughout Christendom, Hunt writes. She had a huge impact in the way that she did ministry there in prison, and it had a great a great influence. But that was only the beginning of Fry's work. 
Among many other things, she established the first nightly shelter for the homeless in London. She was just an amazing woman. And Elizabeth Fry was really the kind of woman that Paul is describing here in 1 Timothy, a woman that was devoted to every good work. So that by the time she was 60, she had a reputation for good work. She didn't wait until she was older. She began this ministry when she was in her early 30s. And so that's the qualities that Paul, I think, is referring to here. Thank God for the many good works that are done by good and godly women that make such a difference in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see, number one, then, widows to register on the list. But here's number two, widows to refuse from the list. Look at verse 11. But the younger widows, what? Refuse. For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. So not all widows were eligible to make Paul's list. Refuse is a very strong word here. Uh, It's a word used in in chapter 4, verse 7, to speak of rejecting false teachers. There's kind of an adamancy here in this word. They were not eligible to be on the list. You know, this, this tells us that Christian charity is not an entitlement, not even for widows. Some did not qualify for help, and Paul's going to give us some widows that were not to be put on the list here in the early church. And so what, who are they? Well, first of all, widows that are too young. Paul makes it clear that a younger widow was not to be added to the list. Why? What's the rationale behind this? Verse 11, for when they had begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. So what's Paul's concern here? His concern is that a young widow out of sorrow might make a vow to serve Christ in the church and remain a widow for the rest of her life, just giving her life to serve in the church. That's the idea here. She'll make a vow just to serve the Lord, maybe because of the sorrow that she endured by losing her husband at a relatively young age, she will say, you know, I'm going to remain single. I'm just going to serve the Lord for the rest of my life. She would give a vow to the Lord. And according to Numbers chapter 30, verse 9, when you vow a vow to God, guess what? You've got to pay that vow. You don't want to make a vow to God and then not pay it. And so unlike the older women, however, Paul's concern is that she may at some point begin to desire to marry again. She might want to marry She would then find it difficult to keep the vow that she made, that vow that she made maybe during the emotional trauma of the loss of her husband. But because she's still yet young and has a desire for a marriage relationship, she'll end up breaking that vow and, and, you know, or put herself in a very difficult position. Again, one commentator writes, in keeping with those sensual desires, which include not merely sexual passion, but all that is embodied in the marriage relationship, she would want to get married. So breaking her vow would place her in disregard of Christ. Notice where it says wax wanton there. The Greek word here has the idea of feeling sensual desires and to disregard and disregard of. So this word appears only here in the New Testament. It is used in extra biblical literature to describe an ox trying to break out of its yoke. And so it's talking about a strong desire here. There's a danger that a young woman might desire to escape the vow that she made to remain single and to be devoted to the Lord. And she'll no longer want to be on the widow's list. Outwardly, it might look like she would be a model of virtue, but inwardly, she could actually become resentful and even hostile against God. She has to remain in that state in order to keep her vow. So at best, she would be unfulfilled. She would be unhappy. She would be perhaps miserable, unable to teach other godly women uh, virtue. And worse than that, her strong desire for her husband would leave her vulnerable. It would open her up to temptation and all these other things. Um, And so to Paul, this was unthinkable that this woman would be put in this situation that would make her vulnerable, that would make things difficult for her. And notice verse 12 where it says, Again, in verse 12, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. Now, this whole passage is kind of difficult to get right. I want to make sure I'm getting it right here. When it says first faith, protos, pistis, you know, so there's a disagreement on what this might mean. Some think it's talking about her salvation when she first got saved, but 
pistis here, which is a word that means faith, can also talk about a vow or a pledge. In classical Greek literature, that word can be used to speak about a pledge. So it's either talking about her salvation, that she'll put herself in danger, and she'll walk away from her salvation, which she had in Christ, or she'll walk away from that vow that she made when she was, became a widow. Uh, and I think that's really what's in view here. I don't think this is talking about her salvation. I think this is talking about the, the vow that she made as a young widow to just serve the Lord the rest of her days. I think that's what it's talking about here. And so that's why Paul says, look, we don't want to include a young widow on this list. We don't want to put her in a situation that would make her make it difficult on her, make her vulnerable, uh, to make her make a decision that perhaps she would regret later on. But then another group, widows that are too immature. Look at verse 13. And with all, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, not only idle but tattlers also, busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. The second reason is that, you know, they have a lack of maturity. Paul says you don't want to put a widow on the list if they're not spiritually mature. Where, they say, where he says they learn to be idle, that's kind of a Greek idiom. They're idlers, you know, the idea there. You know, part of the ministry of widows in the early church would be to visit houses, you know, for various reasons, going house to house. But if she's not mature, spiritually mature, able to handle this, nothing constructive would take place. At best, trivial activities would occupy her, Paul's saying. And worse than that, there's the potential for destructive behavior to take place as she goes from house to house. You know, what could take place is gossip. She could be a busybody, verse 13, going from house to house. Not only idle, but tattlers also busybodies. The word busybodies is peri ergos, peri around ergos work, working around. But it has the idea of someone who goes around, moves around, and the implication is they are sticking their nose into other people's business. They're talking about things which they ought not talk about, that is not profitable. And, you know, so someone like that it would not be profitable for, uh, to be put on the list to be support or to, be, to serve in the church. And so um, Paul says we don't want anyone like this to put on the list. But also there's another one group, and that is younger widows who can marry. Look at verse number 14. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give not occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So Paul says the best thing that could happen to a younger widow is that she remarry, that she go get married again. Um, and when he says, I will, this is a kind of a, a, a word of authority, bulomai. It's the same word used in 2 Timothy, or 1 Timothy 2.12, where it talks about authority, you know, I will that women keep silent in the church. Here he's saying, I will that younger women marry. Now, this is not merely Paul's personal advice. This is a command, an apostolic command. Now, that's not to say that each and every single woman must find a husband. Of course, that's up to the providence of God. I mean, God is the one that brings people into your life. However, as a general rule, it is good for younger widows to marry, Paul says, Jewish custom encouraged women who lost their husbands uh, to go ahead and get remarried. Now, the Scripture teaches that a woman whose husband has died or a woman who might be the innocent party of a divorce, that they are eligible to remarry. Paul made that clear in Romans 7, 3, that if a, as long as a husband's living, she's joined to her husband uh, while he, he's alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, and she's free to go and get married again. And also, with regard to being the innocent party of a divorce, Paul makes it clear in 1 Corinthians 7, if the unbelieving mate wants to depart, let him depart. God has not uh, called us to war. He's called us to peace. You're not under bondage in that case there. And uh, that's a whole other sermon for a whole other time. But Paul is saying, look, for the younger widows, go get married. Now, those who argue against remarriage, find no support for that in a passage like this. They find absolutely no support. It's God's design for younger women who lose their husbands to go ahead and get remarried. One, again, quoting from uh, another commentator, that protects them from living a life of singleness. Their strong desire for marriage and longing to raise children 
make them ill-suited for, it also protects them from seeking solace in improper relationships. And so uh, Paul says, look, younger widows, go ahead, go out there, get married. And then he describes the responsibilities that come with remarriage in verse 14, bear children, you know, so obviously these are younger widows that could still have children. And go ahead and do that because children are a gift from the Lord. You want to be a mom. You want to bear children. And then also to guide the house. Uh, this is you know, all aspects of, of just being a woman in the home, guiding, managing her home, her, her, home, her household. That is the highest calling for a woman that, that, that is uh, given in the Scripture. And Paul says by doing all this, by remarrying, resuming her role in the home, this would give the enemy no occasion to speak reproachfully against her. This would, you know, stop the enemy from being able to in any way uh, do damage to her. Because look at verse number 15. For some are already turned aside after Satan. Doing this will avoid her from falling into some, you know, pitfalls, which some women have already done. Paul is warning the church since some had already began to follow after Satan in this manner. And so no doubt some of these younger women were perhaps going house to house teaching things that the false teachers in the church at Ephesus were teaching. And uh, or they may have married unbelievers and brought shame to the church, but whatever. They were no longer serving Christ, but they were serving Satan. But then there's another group of widows that are not to be put on the list that Paul talks about. Widows who can be supported by the family. And in the end here, look at verse 15, for some, or verse 16. If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. So Paul kind of ends this whole section here by coming full circle, because if you were with us when we dealt with the first eight verses, we saw that you know, if, the, if, if there's a widow that has a family, the family should take care of the widow that's in the family. In fact, go back to chapter 5 and look at verse number 3. Honor widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow have children or nephews, remember I said the word nephews here, the Greek word is actually grandchildren. So if a woman is a widow and she has children or grandchildren, let them learn to first show piety at home to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before the Lord. Look, it's family's responsibility to take care of their widowed mother or grandmother. If she has children, if she has grandchildren, then they should do that. This is acceptable to the Lord. This is what God would have. Um, and also in verse number 80 says, if any provide not for their own, especially those of their own house, they have denied the faith and they're worse than an infidel. So Paul's kind of coming full circle here, and he's going back to that original premise that family should take care of their family, widows. And if there's no man that can do it, then a woman in, the, in that family should do it. And so there's kind of an order here that he's giving. Um, you know, if there's the, the children should do it. If there's no children, then the grandchildren. If there's no grandchildren, if there's any females in the house, there's no male that can do it. Anyone in the family that can take care of the widows in that family, they should help and support widows in that family. But if there's no one that this woman can turn to and she's needy, then Paul says, then let the church take care of them, that the church relieve them that are widows indeed. If the family can take care of the widows, then the family should do it and relieve the church of that responsibility. But if there's no one, then the church needs to look into helping a widow put her on the list support her, help her, make sure that all her needs are taken care of, that they may relieve the widows that are widows indeed. And so Paul's argument kind of comes full circle. It starts with the family doing it, kind of ends with the family doing it, and says, look, if there's no one there, then the church should do it. These women should be put on the list, and these are the qualifications of those that should be put on the list that should get, should get support from the church. But the bottom line is helping widows brings the promise of blessing from God. God promises to take care of those who take care of widows. He promises to bless those who do that. And uh, notice, well, uh, just in closing, write down Deuteronomy 
It says this, The alien, the orphan, and the widow who are in your town shall come and eat and be satisfied in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. So God promises that when you take care of those that are in need, he will bless you. He'll bless the works of your hands. On the other hand, failing to do so could bring judgment. In Deuteronomy 27, verse 19, Cursed is he who distorts the justice do an alien, an orphan, and a widow. So again, this passage basically teaches us tonight God's special love and care for widows and how that we as the church must reflect that special love and care as the people of God. Amen? Let's bow for prayer tonight. So, Father, we thank you for the Word of God and how practical it is, how it helps us. And these principles, Lord, how they can be applied in our life in many ways, how that we need to take care of those that are needy, to show the love of Christ, to love our neighbor as ourself. These are the practical ways that we share the gospel and the world sees our love, and they know that we are Christians because of the love that we show one to another. Father, I pray that that will be our testimony here in this world, that people will see us loving not just in word, but in deed and in truth. May that be our testimony. For your honor and glory, we pray in Jesus' name.